praise, we're gathered in worship, we're gathered uh, because the Lord God calls us to worship him. Uh, the one who has sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be our savior, to die on the cross for us, that our sins may be forgiven, who sent his spirit to fill us uh, each day. Uh, so welcome, uh, one and all. I just want to uh, embarrass somebody this morning as we start. Uh, a, a beloved member of the church is here back, has had been ill, and, and is now back to church for the first time since Good Friday. Since Good Friday. So however we many weeks and months that is. So if we could just welcome back Ken Post this morning. He's going to hate me for doing that, but just want to say welcome to him. It's Good Friday. And uh, lots of people have been praying for Ken. Ken, we're so glad that uh, you're able to be back here. Welcome, one and all, especially if you're here for the first or second time. Uh, glad that you could be here. There's a lunch following the service, uh, open to everybody. Uh, and especially if you're just visiting, you're more than welcome to come down and connect with some people at the church. There's ushers at the back door with blue lanyards on. They can answer any of the questions you may have about getting around the church, uh, what's happening in the week ahead. You can also email uh, info at blessingshamilton.ca. We'll get back to you right away, hopefully. And there's a visitor information card in the back of many of the chairs and pews. So you can fill that out, hand it into myself or one of the ushers, uh, which would be uh, wonderful. Uh, it's a time for prayer after the service, uh, for, for additional prayer needs that you may have in your life as you come to church this morning. Uh, that's by the prayer banner. There'll be members of the church there to pray with you. Also tonight, following the 6.30 service, to which you're all welcome, uh, the service tonight uh, is, uh, is, the theme is Mercy, Only Mercy, First Timothy chapter 1. And uh, there'll be prayer also after that service uh, at the banner, so you're welcome to participate uh, in that uh, this evening. Well, as we uh, come to the Lord in worship and prepare our hearts, uh, we turn to Scripture, to Psalm 108, and our call to worship uh, is on the screens. I invite you, as you're able, to stand as we say these responsibly. My heart, O God, is steadfast. I will sing and make music with all my soul. For great is your love, higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. All the power, all the 
I will watch and wait for the Savior King. Then my joy complete, standing face to face in the presence of the ancient of death. the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning. It's time to see your song again. Wherever may pass and wherever lies before me. Let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the
as we come to worship this morning, let us lift up our hearts. Well, we do read uh, at Blessings uh, during the Sunday morning service uh, once a month. We read the Ten Commandments responsively in church from the Bible. Uh, they remind us of God's standards for uh, how God calls us to live our lives uh, with Him and with others. Uh, they're not cold rules, uh, but they are a reflection of God's wonderful character. And they help us show our need, uh, they help show us our own need of God's grace. Uh, they apply to each and every one of us equally. We, uh, as people, can't pick and choose from the ways God calls us to live. And we come to this uh, part of Scripture not saying, oh, wow, I, I just made it past that one, or, 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 or I just squeaked by. No, we come recognizing instead, as we read these verses, our deep dependence on Jesus 
for his forgiveness and for transformation. And as we say them out loud together, we're also saying out loud together our, our, our biblical kind of values that we share, our eth- the biblical ethic for living, and they unite us together as a community in Christ called to live out God's love and justice. So I think I'll invite us to stand as we say these, if we could, responsibly from the, let's stand together as we say these responsibly on the screens. God's will for our lives. You shall have no other gods before me, from Exodus 20, verse 3. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not covet. Thank you. Let's sit as we pray. Let's let's sit down and we'll pray together. Well, gracious Father, we do bow before you this morning with thanksgiving for who you are, and we read in Revelation how the 24 elders around your throne, the ones closest to you, they cast down their crowns before the throne of God. Lord, so worthy are those heavenly beings, so full of splendor and glory, even they bow down before you and cast honor and praise before you, the one true and living God. And so, Father, we come humbly this morning and worship before you who was and is and is to come. You are the great and almighty God and nothing is impossible for you. You are the true God, life of life. You are the God who has sent your son Jesus, given your spirit to his church in power and in might and in abundance. And, Lord, we come humbly bowing before you this morning recognizing and confessing with some relief that none of us are perfect people, that, Lord, this week we have sinned, that we have dishonored you, that we have not followed uh, the ways you want us to live or that we even want to live most of the time. We've offended you and we've hurt others. And so, Lord God, we ask that we may know afresh how in Christ you have made all who believe in you new creations that we are not defined by our mistakes. We're not held down by our sins. We don't get what we deserve because of them, but by the wonder and by some miracle, the Lord Jesus has given his life in our place. Though we deserve to die for our sins, he has died for us. And Lord, I pray, we pray that as we come to worship this morning, we may know ourselves to have clean hearts, a new beginning, and be new creations in him. And we pray that our worship, Lord, would be pleasing to you this morning in each and every way. And we ask this in Jesus' name alone. Amen. Well, uh, two things. As uh, as the kids from zero to six go to Calvary Clids, I got a handout for the kids who are uh, grade, what, grade three, seven up. 
uh, handout for the sermon. So uh, kids who are grade, you know, grade two, three, four, five, six, seven, if you're staying in, come get one of these. Eight, kids age zero to six, you can go for a little kids club and Calvary kids club. And as all that happens, I'm going to say a prayer. So let's go. Here you go. Hi, guys. Go ahead. And Lord, we thank you so much for uh, the kids who are going to the Calvary Clids and their leaders. We pray you bless them, watch over them, and uh, guide them as they hear the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll be reading this morning from Jeremiah 17. So if uh, you don't have a Bible with you, there's Bibles in the pews. There's a few in each row, and you can find this on page 665, or about just past halfway, past Psalms uh, in the middle of the Bible. So Jeremiah 17, verses 5 through 8. So as we turn to Jeremiah 17, verses 5 through 8, we hear a powerful image for living. 
either rooted in trust in the Lord or relying on ourselves. It points to Galatians 5, which describes the fruitful life that comes from the Holy Spirit. Let's listen to the words of the prophet Jeremiah, who describes the blessing of being deeply rooted in the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the, wet, in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. This is the word of the Lord. Yeah, thanks, John. And our New Testament reading is Galatians. It's on about a page 1004 in the Pew Bibles. And uh, boys and girls, if you have your Bibles with you, you can find Galatians, remember, by going to the very back of the Bible. Go to Revelation, the last book of the Bible, and then go a little bit to the left, and you'll find all these beautiful letters that Paul writes to uh, the early churches, and others are writing to the early churches. And we're on Galatians chapter 5, and starting this morning at verse number 22, page uh, page numbers up there, and we'll follow this along. If you have a Bible, you're welcome to uh, follow along as we walk through these uh, verses this morning together. Paul writes to the churches of Galatia, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let none of us become conceited, provoking each other or envying each other. Well, let's bow down. Let's pray together if we could. Lord, we come this morning with many thoughts on our minds. Some of us are distracted. Uh, some of us are tired. Some of us... Um, uh, have had a really busy week. Uh, Lord, other of us have our minds very clear. Uh, I pray, Lord, that you may send your spirit um, among us this morning in a fresh and new and wonderful way. Lord, that we may hear your word for us, uh, that we may have hearts that receive it, uh, that this may be able to go deep into our minds and into our spiritual lives, and that we may have a new desire to follow Christ and to be transformed into his beautiful and wonderful likeness. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Well, the title of this series is Spirit-Led Living. And Paul, in the book of Galatians, in this section has been answering this kind of question for the Galatians. Uh, what does it really mean to live as a Christian today? What does that really mean for me, Monday to Friday, throughout my regular week, to live as a Christian? Is it, is it on the one hand, does it mean that I have to kind of do a whole bunch of things? And if I do a whole bunch of things, then that really is the core of Christian living. Or on the other hand, uh, Paul's uh, debating with the church there, does it mean that I'm not doing certain things? And if I'm not doing certain things, that's the real core of what it means to be led by the, to, to live the Christian life. And Paul is drawing us deeper than that as believers. He's inviting us into something a lot deeper. In these verses, he's, he's kind of like a spiritual surgeon. And he has his scalpel out. And he's going deep, I hope, into your heart and into my heart, regardless of where you are in your spiritual journey this morning, if you call yourself a Christian or not, or if you're thinking about it, wherever you may be. Paul is is going deep into the human heart here, like a surgeon in a way, looking at what motivates you and what motivates me. And, and, and when I'm living throughout the week and I'm looking at a situation in the world around me or in my work or family or some other thing in culture around me, Paul is teaching us here in these verses and the Galatians in these verses who kind of had gotten this wrong and in a way had oversimplified what it means to live as a Christian or were being taught that wrongly. 
He is saying to them, look, living as a Christian every day is something deeper. It's something deep about the human heart. That the Christian faith, Paul is saying, is, is a heart faith. It's a heart religion. Now, Jesus himself teaches something like this. If you remember in Matthew chapter 7, and people come to Matthew, uh, not come to Matthew, come to Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, and they, uh, they say, look what we've done. Man, I, uh, we've prophesied. Uh, we've cast out demons in your name. Uh, we've done this and we've done that. And, and what does Jesus say to those who are listening to the conversation about these people? Jesus says to them what? Remember that in, in Matthew 7, verse 20? He says to them, by their, by their fruit, uh, you will know them. By their fruit, you'll know them. Uh, Jesus is talking about something of the transformation of the human heart. And Paul is teaching us in these verses that we're coming to in a minute that the Christian life is, is not first and foremost about human regulation, about how good a person I can be. It's first and foremost about how God is transforming me, how God is transforming my heart. And that really is the core of spirit-led living that Paul is trying to teach the Galatians. And here's the sermon this morning in just a few uh, verses, a few words. So this, and, and boys and girls, if you have your uh, sheets that I gave you out there, I think they sold out, which is great news. Um, here on the back here, you can add some notes to this. The spirit-led life is about, number one, becoming the real you in Christ. Number two, cutting ties with the old self. And number three, the spirit-led life is about keeping in sync with the spirit. Well, number one, the spirit-led life is becoming the real you in Christ. We may spend uh, more, more time here as we walk through these. Verse 22, but Paul says, the fruit of the spirit. Uh, a few things before we jump into the list of the fruit. Uh, Paul starts this with that word, but the fruit of the Spirit. What, 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 why does he say but? Remember where we are in these verses. If you have your Bible, you can look up and you can see in verse 21 and 20 to 21 that uh, Paul is saying but because he's contrasting these fruit of the Spirit with something else, isn't he? There's a great contrast that Paul is setting up here for you and for me as we discover and think and pray what it means for me to live as a Christian every day. He's saying, look, there's basically two things that your life can turn into. You can have your life reigned by the flesh and the sinful nature, up in verse 21, or you can have your life reigned by Christ and by the work of his Holy Spirit in your life. And how different are those two things? Uh, the one on the work of the, of the flesh, remember, is, uh, is, is living in a place of, 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 of wickedness, living in a place of, of loving and following the desires deep within me, the sinful desires in me that I, that I know deep down are wrong. Uh, living according to the flesh is, remember Paul lists them up there in verse 21 about sexual sin and about um, religious uh, heresies, following other things that may not be the spirit of, of social dissension, of hatred and bitterness and, and strife and jealousy and, and envy and not content and, and, and drunkenness and, 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 and substance abuse. And on the other hand, he says there's another list. There's, a, there's, the, there, there's, the, there's, there's the fruit of the spirit, he's saying. Now, I remember Lindy and I lived in Montreal for uh, seven years, wonderful city, fantastic city, and one Saturday, I remember Lindy saying, um, hey, let's go down to the Biodome, uh, down there side of Montreal, near, near where the Big O is, and we'll take the kids down there, and uh, we went, and, and, and I have this memory etched in my mind of walking into the Biodome. It was a cold winter day in Montreal, kind of freezing, Ooh, very chilly, snowy. Uh, they get snow in Montreal, they don't get it here as much, and... We walked in there, and it was so warm inside of that biodome. It's a glass dome kind of in Montreal. And inside it was filled with this warm air. And inside were these huge tropical plants, like really massive tall plants. The leaves were like two feet by like six feet high. They had these flowers inside the biodome that were like, the blooms were as big as a suitcase. Uh, they had streams kind of flowing in there. And I remember walking into that, uh, being so struck with how beautiful it was, how comforting that was. Uh, 
It just I can feel it right now, the warm air, and I can see those green leaves kind of just blowing, and I can see the winter outside the biodome of Montreal and the snow and the ice. And, and what Paul is saying is there's a contrast between living in the flesh and living by the Spirit, which could not be more different. Living in the flesh, like I said last week, is like a bird pooping on your head and the poop running into your eyes. Oh, it's awful, terrible. Living by the Spirit is more like walking into a garden filled with good things where, the, where grace reigns, where beauty reigns. Living by the flesh is, is, is kind of like my life is dominated by things that I hate and I'm, I'm anxious and I'm guilty and, and, I, and I don't know why I'm drawn to this wickedness. And living by the Spirit is, maybe it's more like standing in a mountain stream with bare feet and cool water going over your feet and thinking, this is refreshing. They're so different, the two living by the flesh and living by the Spirit, living in a place of darkness that goes nowhere except deeper into my broken self and living in the light of Christ. They're so different. That's the first thing I want us to notice as we learn about what it means to become the real you. Also, if you could just notice, but the fruit of the Spirit, if you could just uh, notice here that there's a difference in the Bible between the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the graces of the Holy Spirit, or the fruit of the Holy Spirit, right? There's a difference. Let me tell you the difference. The, the gifts of the Holy Spirit in, in, in 1 Corinthians are, are different. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are specific gifts that there's not an exhaustive list there, but that people in the church who are uh, justified, who have given their lives to Christ, uh, uh, that there is, they are, when they are justified, they re, they, they re, they're, 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 there's a... There's a new heart, a new beginning that starts in them. And, and believers have gifts to serve the church. They have certain gifts. Not everyone has the same gifts. Um, for example, um, you know, say someone came to me. I, I don't necessarily have the gift of encouragement. Some of you might have the gift of encouragement. If somebody came to me, say he was a guy who was married and he had kids, and he came up to me one day and he said, you know, Pastor Greg, uh, I just don't love my wife anymore. You know, it's, it's over. I'm kind of tired of it. I, I think I'm walking away. I, I might say as someone who does not have the gift of encouragement, you know, that's about the dumbest thing I've heard all week. Do you remember your wife when you first married her? <laughs> Do you remember the day she walked down the aisle and your eyes locked? Why are you so distracted by other things? Get out of your, <laughs> you know what I would say as a non-encourager. Grow up. That's a pretty cold thing to say, isn't it? I mean, it's very cold. Someone who had the gift of encouragement, I mean, I would say, do you want to be alone when you're 50, 50, sitting at a bar on a Friday night alone and your kids are somewhere else? Is that the life you want? That's a bad life. Make an effort. I don't have the gift of encouragement. If you had the gift of encouragement, it's a very bad advice. You should not give someone that advice. It's cold, isn't it? It's very cold. It's not caring. It's not very deep either. It just says, don't do that. If I had the gift of encouragement, I might say to them, hey, brother, you know, what are you running from? Uh, what do you, what do you, what, what's really bothering you? I might say to them, hey, brother, what's the pain in your life that you're covering up right now that you're dealing with in a way that's destructive? Right? If you have the gift of encouragement, you might have that kind of conversation. Some, some Christians have one gift, say, of encouragement, and others don't. And the gifts of the Holy Spirit are, are not the same for everyone, are they? That's my sidebar example on the gifts. Whereby the fruits of the Holy Spirit, listen to this, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, every Christian is given, right? Every Christian is given the fruits of the Holy Spirit from the beginning of the list all the way to the end of the list. And, and, and that's the difference here. This is, a, this is a global list for every believer that God is going to draw these uh, things into your life and my life because of the Spirit in me. And they are for everyone. And notice, before we get into the list as well, that they are singular. Have you noticed that before? Somebody mentioned this to me a few weeks ago, actually, in anticipation of this verse. It's not fruits, S, of the Holy Spirit. It is fruit singular of the Holy Spirit. What are we talking about here? Why is that? 
I think the reason, the reason is that as the Holy Spirit works in your life and in my life, God is not necessarily just working on one characteristic or another that are separate from each other. Understand this as we come to the list of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I might have said fruits when I read it. Fruit of the Holy Spirit. That this is nothing less than the, the moral glory of Jesus Christ in all of its fullness being worked into the believer's heart, into your heart and into my heart. It's nothing less than that. It's nothing less than the, the moral glory of the Lord Jesus that's happening in me. We cannot separate these one from the other. And I can't pick and choose one or the other either. I can't say, hey, I want to be, be gentle, but I don't like the, uh, the self-control one so much, for example. We can't pick and choose them. This is God by his Holy Spirit working the life of Christ in you and me. The Christian life is, is us having the life of God in our souls, having the life of Christ in me. And so when we pray, when we have our, our, our spiritual, as we're going through hard things, when I'm thinking about walking away from my wife, for example, um, what I do is I, I pray, Lord Jesus, will you please, uh, by your spirit, give me an extra measure of the likeness and moral wonder of Christ in my life and transform that pain and difficulty in my life into beautiful fruit that bloom and that grow and that are sweet to taste. Let my life, Lord, be like that. Heal me. And it's not too hard for the Almighty. It's the life of Christian discipleship, isn't it, that, that happens in this kind of way. We cannot separate one from the other. Okay, so now you're saying, Pastor, what about the list? Here's the list. Becoming the real you in Christ. Well, let's go through one by one. And uh, I left blanks on those kids in grade four and five. There's blanks there. You can fill them in as we go. Um, but the fruit of the Spirit is, and I want you to see these not as human characteristics, but the life of Christ in me. These are the, this is the glory of Jesus. What is love? Love is to serve a person for their own good and not what it brings you. Love has a cost to it. Love is you or me being changed in our schedules and workloads and efforts um, because I'm looking out for what's better than somebody else, for somebody else, right? It's, it's changing the time of your appointment because it's better for somebody else or being home at a certain time because it's better for someone else in your household. Jesus says there's no greater love than this that you would lay down your life for your friends. Love is so costly. It's about seeking and serving what's, what is best for someone else regardless of what happens for you. Love is not an emotion. It's part of the moral character, the wonderful glory. Joy. What's joy? Joy is delight in God. Right? Joy is delight in God uh, and, 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 and delving into, enjoying the beauty of God. What does Mary say in Luke chapter 1? She says, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. What does Isaiah have in his life in chapter 15 of Isaiah? He has delight in God. Um, joy in the Greek, it comes from that word charis, which is the word around grace. A a and joy could be translated as grace recognized. Ah, oh, man, I, I got joy in my life because when I'm in a situation that's hard or difficult, ah, I, I, I pray, Lord, will you... By your spirit, will you work in my heart right now a new recognition of your grace, of your mercy, and of your, the fruit of your spirit? What about peace? Love, joy, and peace. Peace is the, a Greek word for wholeness. It means being held together. Peace is a sense of deep, what, confidence in the control of God. No matter what the situation is around me, peace we see in the life of Jesus when he's standing in the boat in the storm and the waves are all bashing up against him um, and things are going, the people around him are going crazy, uh, but yet he's standing there because he, he knows God is God. He is God. He's not torn apart. Do you feel like in hard times you get 
pulled apart. Your mind goes in ten directions. You're anxious. You're not sure what, what to do, what's next. That's fr- the fruit of the Spirit is peace. I'm held together peace, by the peace of God. Patience. What's patience? Don't ask me. I don't have that one. Ability to face Christian, to face trouble, right? Patience is the ability as a Christian to face a hard situation without losing your mind, (laughs) without blowing up, (laughs) without turning red of the face, you know, and the opposite may be a fits of rage from the flesh, right? Jesus is so patient. Peter, who denies him at the fire barrel and says, I don't know this man. I've never seen this man, Jesus. Denies that he has a relationship with Jesus. Jesus meets him on the beach at the end of the book of John, and does Jesus lambaste him? Does Jesus lose his mind on Peter? No. Jesus is so patient with Peter. He doesn't blow up. He draws him closer. He opens his heart. What about kindness? Kindness is the ability to serve someone Practically, uh, without uh, doing it for manipulative reasons. That's kindness, right? That that, that I'm going to serve someone in in, in a practical way uh, because regardless of what the outcome may be, there's someone who's in need and I'm going to help them with that need through an action, practically, usually, and I don't really mind what they think of me after that, whether they say something nice to me or, or not, for example. That's, that's kindness. What about goodness? Goodness is being the same person in every single situation, right? Doing the right thing in every situation. Jesus, in every situation he met, whether it was Martha and Mary and Lazarus, or whether it was uh, the rich young ruler, or whether it was this, the Phoenician woman, Whoever it was, Jesus was good. He was the same person in every situation. He wasn't vying and looking and twisting and whatever. It was every situation he was deeply good, inherently good, doing what is right, knowing what is right in every situation. What about faithfulness? Faithfulness, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of faithfulness. That's... uh, about being reliable to your word. Being a person who, when you, when you, when you say something, that the other person has no doubt whatsoever that's going to happen. What, what a joy that is to be in a relationship with someone who's faithful. Was Jesus faithful? Uh, when Jesus, in Luke, sets his face to go to Jerusalem, to the cross, even though there's all kinds of difficult things in front of him, he knows even crucifixion, he does not give up on the mission the Lord has given him. Jesus is completely and utterly reliable, completely faithful. What about gentleness? Gentleness is the opposite of being self-absorbed. It's the opposite. It's the same as meekness. Sometimes it's translated meekness. Jesus says, I am lowly in heart. I am gentle in heart. There's a lowliness, a gentleness to Jesus. The opposite of thinking about, oh, like me, me, me. I I, want to make sure that, 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 that others around me are cared for and blessed. And the last fruit is self control. What's self-control? It's the, ability to, it's the ability to be able to see what's important in a situation, not what's urgent, right? You're, you're in a situation, you might be drawn to that thing. Well, that's not really that important. What's the big picture? What's the, what's the, what, 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 what's the, what's, what's the thing that matters the most in this situation? Jesus was full of self-control. When the devil tempts him in the desert around his physical needs, spiritual needs, power, Jesus is able perfectly to respond to him with Scripture. I I, I hope you'll see, if you're looking this morning, for what it means to be the real you, what it means to, to grow as a Christian. I hope you'll see that this is the person, this is the kind of heart, that kind of harvest that God wants to develop in us. Right? God yeah, wants us to do this and not do that, but that's all of an outcome 
of a spirit-led life of a heart that is transformed into love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Lord God, will you grow in me the moral glory of Jesus that others... <laughs> May experience that in me. Lord, I have so many failings. Will you grow these in me? I personally, friends, have so many failings. Lord, will you grow these in me? Can you pray that prayer this morning? Uh, maybe you've been thinking to yourself, you know, ah, man, I, I, got, I need something more in my life. I need something deeper in my life. I, I, I'm looking for a life that actually matters here. I want a life that's going to last. I'm actually kind of tired of living out there in the winter outside the biodome of Montreal. <laughs> it ain't so enjoyable. This is the best possible, beautiful life that you can imagine. That the Holy Spirit works in me, the very life of Christ. Hallelujah. And praise God. Friends, before we come off this list, I'll spend the most time on this list. We're going to spend one more minute. I want you to notice that Jesus, that, that Paul uses the word fruit, that it's a gradual thing. You don't see fruit kind of appearing like instantaneously in your backyard. When we, another Montreal moved from Montreal to uh, where we live now in this area, we brought with us an apple tree that we had gotten in Montreal. We planted that apple tree. I ended up getting a chainsaw and cutting that down when I <laughs> built uh, something else. But anyway, the first few years, it was a really nice tree. And uh, it was amazing, you know, that fruit, after year two or three, started to grow. We had apples on our tree, but it didn't come instantly. Uh, they came slowly. Um, are you gentle with yourself? Um, are you loving yourself enough to say, Lord, yeah, my life isn't perfect. I, I know all these things are not lining up with the fruits of the Spirit, but are you gentle enough with yourself? Do you love yourself enough? Do you love your kids enough? Do you love your co-workers enough, you love your wife or husband enough to say, yeah, this is a gradual thing. I am trusting that God is going to gradually bring in your life and my life the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the very moral glory of Christ. It's a gradual thing, but remember, it's also inevitable because you have the Holy Spirit in you. It's going to happen. Whether it's fully right now or whether fully when we stand before Christ and our salvation is consummated, it's going to happen. Your life is going to look like this. Your life is going to look like a, your heart is going to be a heart overflowing with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control against such thing. There's no law. Nothing's going to stop it. It's what God is doing in you. You ever say, Lord, what are you doing in my life right now? Well, God is building always the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's what God is doing. That's what the Spirit is doing in your life and my life. That's how I, I know I'm growing. That's how I know I'm going. I see gradually that, man, you know, two years ago, if that person said that to me, I would be biting their head off. Uh, I'm so ungentle. <laughs> I'm so impatient. But now, amazingly, two years later, Wow, when that person says that at work to me, I actually look at them differently. And I, I look at them, I, I say, wow, that per wow, that's amazing you said that. Uh, you know, Christ died for you. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. Uh, I, I, I don't know why, but I have a new patience in my heart for this situation. That, that's what growing as a Christian means. That's what living as a Christian means. It's not, Paul says, all the outward flashy things. The other gifts of the Spirit that are so flashy, it is who we are, as Pastor Mark said last Sunday night, it's who we're becoming. Well, secondly, real quick, the Spirit-led life is about cutting ties with the old self. All right, cutting ties with the old self. We've got to go real quick here. Those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Uh, what can we say here? He's, uh, uh, the, 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 put it this way. In the Bible, there's all kinds of descriptions of what a Christian is. All right? In the Bible, you hear that a Christian is someone in whom God has done something. God has transferred that person from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Uh, God has made that person to be born again. There's also descriptions in the Bible about a Christian, about things that a Christian does. Right? A Christian repents. A Christian turns from sin. 
Well, here is a, a core thing of what Paul is saying a Christian does, a Christian is. A Christian is someone who crucifies the flesh. That's something that, that's a description of, of, of what a Christian does. A Christian crucifies the flesh. Now, Paul is getting at you and me again, hopefully deeply into the motivational kind of center of our hearts. And he's saying, look, okay, think about as you grow as a Christian, as you do this action as a Christian, as you cut ties with the old self, what are you doing? You're crucifying the flesh with all of its passions and desires, all of its strong emotions, all of the strong feelings, all the strong allures. Remember that word uh, passion, that word desire is over-desire. That I, I'm just over-desiring that thing because I think it will save me. I think it will help me. I think it will authenticate me. I think it will make me better. No, 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 it won't, Paul says, that those desires of the flesh, they won't. Instead, the Christian life, the Christian practice is marked by this. It's marked by crucifying the flesh. Did you know that the metaphor here Paul is using for you as a Christian and for me as a Christian is this unbelievably vivid metaphor, this word picture, that a Christian, do you think about this when you think of a Christian living by the Spirit? A Christian is someone who walks around like a condemned criminal, carrying their cross on the way to execution. I mean, that's, that's, that's one of the marks of the Christian life, that you're walking around kind of like on, with a half a cross on your back, going to the place of execution to do what in my heart every day by the work of the Spirit? To kill the desires of the flesh. To do so without pity, because those desires of the flesh deserve it, right? They're evil. When, 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 when I want to break a sexual ethic on, 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 on how, I, how I live out my sexuality, when, 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 it, when, I, when I can't stop but thinking about how jealous I am of someone else, when I, when I, when, when I desire so much that thing that will comfort me for a very small moment, but I know really is not from God. Paul says that we are called as Christians, as painful as it is, as awkward as it is, to take that work of the flesh and to crucify it, to nail it to the cross. Not the cross of Christ, but to the cross of the heart, as it were. They were called to take those works of the flesh and, and nail them there. And you think in your heart for a minute what that work of the flesh is in your own life this morning that you know needs to be crucified with big nails or structural screws, which I, I learned about this summer with my home reno. Do you as a Christian... Look at that thing you've crucified on the cross. Lord, I want it gone from my life. I'm nailing it up there to the cross of my spirit. I'm saying it's gone, it's over, it's finished. It's no more. Do you nail it up there and say, you know what, I might just take that off this week a little bit and I might just take it down from that cross of my heart and look at it a bit. It's kind of nice. Uh, I might just, I might, I kind of, that gives me a bit, I might just look and caress it a little bit. That sin, that work of the flesh. No. Paul says, take that work of the flesh, whatever it may be in your life this morning, something sexual, something in social relationships, something in what you believe religiously, something in, in substance abuse, how, how you comfort yourself if you are in that way, that fit of rage, whatever it may be, bitterness, whatever that thing is. Paul says, just take that as a Christian practice and by the help of the Spirit, nail it to the cross. Never take it off. Never look at it again. Never caress it. As painful as that will be, and it will be painful if you have been sinning in a way that you're walking outside the biodome in the winter and you're like, man, I love that thing. Oh, man, I, 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 I. maybe I'm having a, a, an affair outside of my marriage this morning and emotionally or sexually. And that person, all I can think about is that person. I'm not married to them. Man, I think about them all the time, and it makes my heart kind of warm when I think about them. Take that and crucify it to the cross, says Paul. It's painful. It might hurt for a minute, but it's got to be decisive. Turn your back on it. Peter says to the Christians in Pentecost, repent and be baptized. It has to be decisive. And the Holy Spirit will help you for it to be decisive. 
It's gone. It's finished. It's no more. There's a whole world of beauty and a whole world of glory and a whole world of love, joy, and peace and the glory of Christ that is for you instead. What a wonderful thing that is. What a joy. What a freedom that is. What is God calling you this morning to crucify? To cut ties with the old. I hope you'll come talk to me or an elder after the service if something in that has really struck you this morning. And number three, real quick, uh, the other thing about spirit-led living is we're called to be keeping in sync with the spirit, aren't we? We're called to be keeping in sync with the Spirit. The Spirit of that life is me keeping in sync. And I won't have much time for this, but just to say, Paul says, since we live by the Spirit, that is, that is the way that, that's, a, that's in the past. That this is how we live as a Christian. I've, I'm being led as a Christian by a shepherd. God is leading me as I live. And the next part is, let me keep in step with the Spirit. Stay in step with the Spirit. And in Greek, that is, if we live by the Spirit, by the Spirit, we should also walk. The Holy Spirit is back to back. It's all about the role of the Holy Spirit in my life and the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. And, and, and what does that mean to keep in sync with the Holy Spirit? Let me just ask you this. Christianity is not a cold way of doing this and doing, doing that, Paul says. No, it's not that. It's about keeping in sync with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? When I was a kid, our parents and, and my sister, we'd walk places. I remember walking like in, uh, in, in amusement parks and so forth. And I have this vivid memory as like an eight-year-old kid of looking down as I walked and watching the eight legs all stepping as we walked. And every so often, it was very interesting, I noticed, uh, that every so often for two or three steps, my actual steps would line up with my father's or my mother's. And it'd be like, we'd all be walking at the exact same kind of time. Isn't that the practice of the Christian life? If you... If you're wanting to grow deeper, don't be hard on yourself. <laughs> don't be cold with yourself or others. But go deeper into asking the Spirit, Lord, I belong to Jesus. The Holy Spirit dwells in me. I'm going to set my mind on the things of the Spirit. I'm going to, by the great, I want to walk by the Spirit every day. I want to be in sync through the Word with what the Holy Spirit is calling me. And in verse 26, he says, this is, don't be conceited. People, do people see a world of grace in your life? Do people see a world of the fruit of the Spirit in your life? As we finish this morning, are you longing to become the real you? You can in Christ. You can by the help of the Spirit. Do you need to be cutting ties with the old us? Is there something in your life to cut? All of us have something this, today. All of us have something today to cut ties with, to say no more, it's finished by the grace of God. Do you find yourself to be in sync with the Holy Spirit? If someone else were to see you on the street tomorrow morning or at the workplace Tuesday at 2, would they be astonished to hear that you were a child of the eternal King of heaven? I mean, by what you say and how you act, would they be blown away <laughs> that your citizenship is in heaven where Jesus reigns in all of his moral glory? I guess what I'm asking and what Paul keeps on asking the Galatians is, like, what is the state of our heart? Like, what's the actual state of your heart this morning? Is there a sense that your heart is longing to become more like Christ? Is there a sense your heart is longing to be conformed to the wonders of Jesus? If it's not, wow, that's uh, something to really grow in. If it is, as the prophet Jeremiah tells us, that promise that we'll have a heart of flesh. If it is, rejoice. Because the Christian life, the spirit-led life, is about having a heart that is open and soft and being transformed by the power of Jesus. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, thank you for this opportunity to be in your word. Again, a bit of a hard list to go through and apply to our lives, but 
Father, will you bring us deeper, I pray? Bring every one of us deeper into what it means to walk with Christ, to keep in sync with the Spirit. Lord, let us leave here so encouraged that you love us, that you care for us, that you're changing us. And Lord, do change us because we need changing. And we pray that you may do that in your way and in your time and that you may be pleased with our lives. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We want to be more like Jesus and we so badly need his help. We pray these things in his name. Amen.
I invite you to bow down and pray with me together. Dear Heavenly Father, gracious God, thank you so much for gathering us here every Sunday as a church with one mind and united hearts to worship you and praise you. And be blessed by your holy presence through the spirit and the word. Today is the day of international prayer. The international day of prayer. We acknowledge now here that worship like this is such a privilege. We should always be, grat be grateful and cherish. For we know that at the same time here, uh, there are many places and countries in the world that your people are under persecution, where public worship like this is not allowed. Christians are suffering or even arrested or tortured for a namesake. Almighty God and merciful Lord, we pray that your protection, strength, and courage for believers living under sufferings, for your dear brothers, for our dear brothers and sisters, Steve and Sophia, and Yiwan, and other many other Christians in China or all over the world. We pray that you, you mobilize China, uh, Christians from every corner to help them in practical support and through their donations, advocacy, or providing refuge as we wanted to remember those in prison as if we were together with them. Father, thank you so much for mobilizing your children from different churches of Canadi from Canadian Reformed Church to start a missional congregation like this called Blessing Christian Church about 10 years ago. Thank you for keeping us alive and active in your mission and attracting more and more people to join our church, to join the big family. We pray especially for those 8 to 10 people who joined in our membership class yesterday that they feel a strong sense of community here and continue to be enriched and nourished spiritually for a kingdom's sake. We pray for the outreach event next Wednesday, this Wednesday evening. Please anoint the speaker, Pastor Winston and me, to inspire and motivate your beloved children, whoever comes, to be strengthened in faith and love, equipped with wisdom and truth, to love our neighbors as ourselves, to preach the word, be prepared in season or out of season, and to declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. Lord, thank you so much for hearing and being with us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, David. Um, our time, uh, there's time in our service now for an offering. Uh, if you're visiting today, you're not uh, bound to do this. Uh, this goes to uh, the deacons who have a ministry of mercy and compassion in the, in the area and in the church. And there's a cause of the month, which is for one of the refugee families that recently was supported by this church and a, another church uh, in the city to, um, hey, you might recognize they've been in blessing several times. There they are. Um, uh, and, and this is a, you, you can give, if you give today through deacons at blessingshamilton.ca, a portion will go to this cause and, and the work uh, uh, to help this family uh, land here in Canada and get going. And a portion of it will go to the regular work of the deacons. And if you're a member of the church, you can also remember uh, the regular givings to the ministry uh, budget of the church through a different email. Uh, and you can find that on, on church social.
Well, I invite you to stand for our blessing, if you're able. And, and as, as uh, you stand, I'll read you this charge from uh, Romans chapter 13. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to awake from your slumber. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over and the day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Savior, the King of life, I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ, I 
stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ.